Science and hospitality have more in common than you might imagine. Both of them ask us to step away from our frozen habits and beliefs and see the world from a fresh perspective. Think about all the times you became aware of something, the uh, mustard stain on your shirt, uh, just how smart and funny your younger brother is, uh, just how little you knew about something that you really thought you had wired because you saw the look on somebody's face or somebody pointed out something which was obvious from their perspective but you just did not caught from yours. It's easy to have a false sense of mastery. We've, we master our own perspective, but it's, it's so hard to kind of see beyond that. I think when we do the extra work, when we grapple, we, we, we take on the real complexity of the world, the world becomes more interesting and we acquire the ability to live a little bit more deeply. Now, I experienced a massive shift in perspective when I took a class in, in human neuroanatomy. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. The professor walked in, if it helps, he looked kind of like a young Tom Hanks, carrying a couple buckets that looked like they'd just fallen off a shelf at the Home Depot. And he sloshes them up on the table, and he's talking about the syllabus. He pries the lid off of one, and there's this immediate shock of the formalin. There's this smell that kind of burns the inside of your nose. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to like this. And then he reaches into the first bucket, and he, he pulls out this, this gruesome, grotesque thing kind of the, the, the size and shape of, a, I don't know, wrinkled pair of children's hiking boots with a color I, I, I couldn't name. Now, from here on in, if you've ever done a dissection, maybe in high school or college, you know the drill. You get your specimen on a tray, you look at the tray, and you think, my God, I know this tray. I ate lunch off of this last, <laughs> last period. Now, at this point, I want you to, if you're keeping score, please note, it looked terrible. It smelled worse. Oh, and the texture. The texture, someplace between, I don't know, raw liver, spam, and jello. It, it, it offends all of the senses. This is a terrible, terrible object I'm celebrating today. Nevertheless, I got my geek on. So, got the textbook in one hand and a scalpel or sometimes a grapefruit spoon in the other hand, and kind of working through this methodically, learning the arcane name for every bulge, wrinkle, and spot. And it is... Well, I, I kind of imagined this was going to be like brain surgery. That seemed exciting. It was a lot more like studying for a, a vocabulary test. A little dry, a little academic. About three weeks into the class, the professor started talking to us as we're, we're, we're actually working away on our brains. And he reminded us for the first time directly that these brains came from people, people who were probably about the age of our grandparents. And at this point, my brain had a face, and it was the face of a woman named Mrs. Heinz, who's one of the kindest people I've ever known in my life, and she was in her mid-80s at the time, and she was well aware of her own mortality. He reminded us that this person might have lived nearby. We might have sat next to them on a subway or at a ball game. They knew what it was like to have beliefs, desires, passions, you know that thing where you, you, there's something that you noticed, you pay attention to, and it is so special, so private, so perfect, that you don't put it into words. You don't share it because it's just for you. I, I think this is what being a person is about, and that's something that this person carried around with him. It was pretty clear the connection he was making. This, this, this gruesome object in front of us that I was literally holding in my hand was the embodiment of somebody else's humanity, of their perspective. And it was complex, it was relatable. This is someone who probably loved someone, someone who knew what it was like to have your heart broken. This was real humanity. And at this point, he just let the class be silent for a minute. And it was the silentest class I've ever been in my life. And I don't know if you believe me, but it's true. I, I've been telling this story for 20 years. I cannot tell it without getting goosebumps. I'm, I have them right now. Because this was a really important moment in my life. At this point, well, imagine the problem. How do you will yourself? How do you imagine your being, your humanity, your essence into three pounds of mushy flesh? This is not easy. But at that moment, holding it in my hand, I felt it. I felt it in my bones. Call it a, a, a secular conversion experience. At this moment, I understood mortality in a completely different way. 
and I felt challenged to understand my imperfect humanity and the imperfect humanity of everybody else around me in a completely different way. Our being is the projection of this incredibly fragile, delicate, but miraculously able pile of tissue. Our strength, the thing that allows us to, to, to go to other planets, to, to, to understand life, rests on something that is fragile. Now, when you let yourself down, or you let other people down, and we do this all the time, this is a point where I find it really useful to remember that. You know, that this, this, this brain that's enabling all of this just evolved to make sense of the world, to help us make it through another day in exactly the same way that our heart evolved to pump blood and our spleen evolved to do whatever the hell it is that the spleen does. <laughs> There's so much common ground that we have as physical beings and so little basis for judgment. And if you are able to judge somebody by the quality of their spleen function, you are a very strange person. <laughs> now, if you've been listening carefully, you might have noticed there is a problem in the story I just told you. This, this brain on the dissection table that I was looking at wasn't in love, wasn't brokenhearted, wasn't pondering anything. It was stone dead. Think about it. An object the size of a small loaf of bread, 100 billion neurons, 1 to 5 trillion connections of cold, inert complexity. But where was the agile, relatable, complex humanity that I was looking for? Now comes an enormous letdown for all of you guys. I study how people understand speech recognition. And, I, and you're probably thinking this is a terrible bait and switch. <laughs> where, where is the humanity in all of this? But I'll just tell you that in science, we pick and choose our battles, and we hope that the little ones will sometimes illuminate the big ones. Now, speech perception is actually a harder problem than you might imagine it is. Every time someone opens up their mouth, it's actually a, a slightly different problem. This is a, a terrible picture of uh, my friend and colleague, Seppo. I, I do, do, do my brain research, my speech research with him. He's going to say something. I want you to listen very carefully to it. Okay? Make sure that you understand every word. It's hard to recognize speech. Okay, did everybody get that? Let me play this one more time with a little bit more context. Listen carefully again, please. The storm hit the coastline pretty hard. I think the waterfront will recover, though. It's hard to recognize speech. You did hear the same thing both times, right? You did not. And the reason for that is we don't just hear speech. We claw it out. We claw sense out of it. We try and impose order on it. We try and make sense of the sounds, and we try and jam them into words, and we try and understand how those words have meanings, and those, words, uh, those meanings relate to other words in the sentence, and we relate them to our understanding of the world and our perception and that moment, and we force all those pieces to align into one coherent story until some jerk points you in the wrong direction and makes you think we're talking about speech perception when so clearly we are talking about a nice day at the beach. What happens is, when one piece is out of, uh, out of place, we have to reinterpret everything, because the goal is still the same. We want this all to add up to one coherent story. Now think about this. You've been hearing about three words per second for as long as I've been talking, and I guess for most of the afternoon at this point, and I'm just getting warmed up. There are not a lot of pauses, and yet you're keeping up. So as quickly as people are talking to you, you are doing all of this elaborate work to make all the pieces fit. It's astonishing. Now, here's, here's the challenge. How do you study a brain that works so fast? How do you study the brain working at the speed of thought? I think the first trick is you need to stop thinking in terms of pictures and start thinking in terms of movies. Now, the first movie was created in 1878 to win a bet. And the bet was about whether a horse takes all four feet off the ground at full gallop. It took a little bit of ingenuity and about 12 frames of, of film to resolve a debate that had been going on for probably thousands of years. We want to borrow that. So what we do in my lab is we measure magnetic and electrical events that are associated with your brain at work, 
and we put them together, and we make movies. High-speed movies of brain activation. Not still pictures. Just to give you a sense of what something like that looks like, I, I, let me give you the very simplest possible uh, stimulus here. Someone just hearing a single random syllable. Watch, watch carefully and listen to it. Bah. OK, you all got that? OK, let me slow it down. What I'm going to show you now is about three-tenths of a second, but I'm going to show you at one one-hundredth of the original speed. There's a lot going on. I'm showing you a completely different kind of complexity than we're used to seeing. Right? We're used to seeing fiber tracks and, 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 and fine neuroanatomy that has this incredible detail. But there's a temporal detail and a structure to this which is just as exciting and, 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 and informative. I would argue that sometimes you just have to see the, the, the forest fire for the trees. When we look at this, we can make some sense of it. We know that some areas of this have something to do with representing word sounds or meaning or sentences or reminding us what we're talking about. So I've given you a bunch of pieces to the puzzle, and it is my sincere hope that you are not satisfied, because I am not satisfied. What you've got so far is a parts list, right? just, just, just a disarticulated pile of, of, of parts. Imagine that I took a really nice mechanical watch and I painstakingly took it apart, and I put all the little cogs and gears and springs uh, in a little glass jar. I'm sure it'd make a lovely sound if you shook it, but it's not going to help you tell time. If we want to understand that, we have to take another step. We need to show the same kind of ingenuity, and we have to come up with a better kind of analysis. And what we did is what all good scientists and good artists do, uh, we stole. We stole the best ideas that we could from economists, from aerospace engineers, from physicists, from mathematicians. And we found analyses that allowed us to look at how all of these parts of the brain interact from millisecond to millisecond, moment to moment, how they trade information with each other, how they work together to assemble a coherent understanding. Here's kind of what that looks like. This is the same three-tenths of a second shown at 100th speed of someone just listening to Ba. Looks kind of like an over-caffeinated basket full of snakes. There's a lot going on here. It is complex, and that's good. It's good because so are we. It's also good because for me this is job security. We understand a tiny bit of this. Uh, I'd like to understand the whole picture. When I look at images like this, and everything I've been looking at, kind of the, the, the 10 years or so that we've been developing and working with these kinds of analyses, there are a couple things that, that really kind of stick out. One of them, it's just the relentlessness of it all. The mind never stops. Fellow struggling meditators, you know what I'm talking about, right? You are sitting there, your mind is contemplating itself, and then all of a sudden you're thinking about a bill that you probably should have paid yesterday, or the tension in your hips, or for reasons that you do not understand, the lyrics from the theme song from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, it's just there, okay? Namaste. <laughs> Okay, so what's happening in this relentlessness is we are seeing this, this high-speed, fluid improvisation, virtual machines that are kind of assembling themselves on the fly, figuring out what information is relevant to solve this immediate problem, putting it together, and then dissolving. And so and, and reconfiguring so that we can have another network to solve another problem, maybe using some of the same parts. Constant shape, shape shifting. Um, I don't know if this helps you, but the visual metaphor that's stuck in my head is, is imagine you're in a mall at holiday season. It is crazy crowded, kind of rushing around looking stressed out because it's the holidays, and all of a sudden, a flash mob jumps up and performs this very highly choreographed uh, scene from Les Mis. And a moment later, in another part of the mall, another group of people, possibly including the same bass player, bass players get to work with everybody, jump up, and, and, and I don't know, they're playing Stairway to Heaven. Okay? And it just goes on, just wave after wave of reinvention, of the same kind of amorphous mass suddenly finding organization in some part to solve some immediate problem. Another thing about this which is incredibly beautiful is that it is an improvisation. I hope you took this from the example with Seppo a moment ago, if we change the task just a little bit, why you're listening, what you want to do, how you're going to use this information, what your context is, it's a different network, a different flash mob, a different improvisation. 
It's like the champion chef on Chopped, cooking, I don't know, three recipes per second with just whatever groceries are thrown at them for every waking moment of your day. It is glorious, dazzling, relentless improvisation. Now, to me, what this is all, the reason this is all interesting to me is I think we're living at a really interesting moment in science, and I hope I'm making some small contribution to this moment. I think we're living in a moment where the static images that we've used for so long to understand how we work, how we interact with a rapidly changing world, are giving way. They're giving way to movies that capture this complex, dynamic process, this dance that we have with the world that allows us to function. It, it, it's a moment of, of, of unfreezing of our sense of, of human possibility and what it means to be human. And as this understanding, as our perspective unfreezes, what we're seeing is our true gift. What we evolved to do is to improvise, to accommodate, to react to whatever it is that the cosmos throw at us, and to do it with astonishing speed and, and, and overwhelming sophistication. We are change monsters. Now, looking around, reading the newspapers, uh, this feels like a terrifying moment. It feels like everything that we understood yesterday is different today, that, 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 that the world is constantly changing and the rate of that change is only increasing. It can be completely overwhelming, but everything that I know about the brain tells me that it's up for the challenge. It's got this, so we've got this. Thank you.